<laughs> the nurses would beat them in a game of football. I believe the nurses would simply trample them to death. He went 10 hours without scoring a goal in the second half of the season. If you're a postman, you go 10 hours without delivering a letter, you get fired. <laughs> I mean, are we just signing players or appointing people because it's a nice thing to do? Or do we actually want to fucking win things? Hello and welcome to Football Trending on Joe, the show that covers all the biggest topics on the timeline. Today, I'm joined by Joe's football experts, Wayne Farry, Ruben Pinder and Carl Picknell. Gents, welcome to the show. Today, let's talk about Odeon Igalo, first of all. Now, a lovely story, this. Big United fan. He's actually taken a pay cut to join United. Is he what United need? Uh, he is what we need. He's a striker. But it's a kind of a damning indictment of what where United are at that we sold Romelu Lukaku and that he is actually... Gallo isn't that bad now for what we need because we've let it go this long. But I think when you, when you get down to brass tacks, he's not a good signing by any stretch of the imagination whatsoever. Igalo is, is a, he's been in China for like two years. He's been scoring some goals in China, mm. but any half decent striker from the European leagues scores goals in China. Um, but he's only ever reached double figures in a top flight season in Europe once. That, that season at Watford when he played up front with Dini under Sanchez Flores. Um, and I mean, he might do fine. Expectations are pretty low. So he might do all right. If he scores like, six goals between now and the end of the season, mm. um, then that will be considered like a relative success. Six goals. Six goals. Wow. It's a very low bar, isn't it? But I think like the sort of shock of the transfer and the fact that he's coming from China, nobody's expecting him to be amazing. It's more people are laughing at United for signing, for having to sign him. Now, he was actually the second highest score in, scorer in China. Barca came in for him, <clears throat> but he turned them down. And now he's gone to United. Does that seem a little bit strange? You, you always think Man United aren't going to sink any further than, than they are. You know, you always think this is the bottom, this is the floor. Um, but we, we seem to have a manager that is there. Like it's just people think he's really nice, mm. or at least they did. And it was like, oh, isn't this great? Like, Ali is the manager of Manchester United, you know? And now we've got a striker where it's like, oh, isn't this great? Mm. He's a Man United fan. I mean, are we just signing players or appointing people because it's a nice thing to do? Or do we actually want to fucking win things? It does seem like Oli is signing United fans. He's got Maguire in there. Mm. He's got a few others that are, you know, Wamba Sakura I think mm. is a United fan. Yeah. You know, is he just signing United fans? Well, see, the thing is, like, <laughs> it's great them being a fan, yeah. but the crucial quality that a footballer needs to have is that they're good at football. Yeah. And a lot of United's players aren't good at football. I'm a United fan and I'm shit at football. <laughs> so I don't think it's that, true, that is... I don't, yeah, I don't think that is the qualifying... You're expecting a phone call from all these <laughs> Well, I'd be better than some of them, you <laughs> yeah. know? But I do think that I de whatever, the, whatever the criteria is for choosing players, um, it isn't the right ones. And also, I'm not really sure United, the people upstairs, really care who they sign. Do you think this shows up United's recruitment, recruitment process once again? Do you know, is that yeah, a failure? I, I mean, 100%. Yeah. They've signed a 30-year-old from the, the Chinese Super League. Like, yeah. And if you look at the other strikers they were linked to, it was Rondon, there was Islam Slimani. It's like, what, where's the scouting? These are just players that played in the Premier League a couple mm -hmm. of years ago. Yeah. Like, what is that? And on the point of them just signing United fans, it's like, I'm embarrassed for them. It's nice, yeah, but it's like it's not Make a Wish Foundation, you know. It's it's a football team. Mm. It's Manchester United, supposedly the biggest club in the world. Cameron Jerome's a Man United fan. He's mm. played in Turkey. Yeah, that's a do key, him a favour. That's a good point, though, is that people kind of took the piss out of Inter Milan this this season during the January transfer window for signing kind of Premier League um, kind of cast cast offs, but at least they're second in Syria. Mm. Um, United are going for the kind of players now that Besiktas are going for, mm. that Galatasaray are going for, the Trabzonspor. Like, the, we used to take the mick out of like, those teams for like, for, you know, the Turkish league for being like a retirement league for, for Premier League yeah, strikers. Yeah. United, are, United are becoming that now, and they're struggling to compete with them as well. Because <laughs> you know? they you don't know. have the uh, social media uh, yeah. announcements <laughs> yeah. of Besiktas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. They, 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 no one can beat Besiktas. No one, no. I think, I think you can sum it up best by saying that if West Brom signed a Gallo and had Ole Gunnar Solskjaer as the mm. manager, you'd mm. raise your eyebrows mm. and think, come on. And didn't Aston Villa? Yeah. yeah. Aston Villa I mean, turned him down. He's yeah. not good enough for the Villa yeah. team, who, who currently have one fit striker. Yeah. So I think, there you go. That just, all, really. just going back to something Carl mentioned earlier about the other players that they were linked with, players like Rondon and Slimani. These are 
target men mm-hmm. who are decent finishers, right? Now they got they shipped out Lukaku in the summer. Solskjaer was probably expecting a replacement that he didn't get, hence why he's had to play Greenwood a lot and move Martial in central and et cetera, et cetera. But why did you ship out Lukaku if you're going to try to replace him in January with a similar profile of player who's much worse? Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, Lukaku can hold the ball up. There's question marks around his first touch, I think is slightly exaggerated. But Lukaku is like a sort of, is a physical striker and a brilliant finisher. Ships him off out on loan to bring in Igalo. Yeah, what's going to happen with this, this Ole Gunnar Solskjaer way of like, young talent and mm. like attacking fluid football and mm. it's just not he plays turgid football really defensive stuff and now he's signing he's trying to sign target men <laughs> yeah. this transfer has just completely undermined that <coughs> yeah. whole like just, oh ollie's back the united way's back mm. it'll be fine it's like well no it's not because now you just this transfer even though he might do okay mm. is just a sign of real desperation yeah i think if you don't if you might yeah. interrupt i think what became abundantly clear after the PSG win, and particularly this season, towards the end of last season, is that, as you said, the Ole Gunnar Solskjaer way, when that was good, it was just a wave of optimism. Yeah. You know, that was it. He was like floating on a wave of optimism. And then when things got realistic, like they do for actual football teams, the Ole Gunnar Solskjaer way ended up being, it's just, it's just talk. It's mm-hmm. just talk. And what is the, in terms of strategy and tactics, there is none. It's just him saying, Oh, the boss, huh? Sir Alex, what a guy. His parking space, I didn't sit in it. Do you know what I mean? This sort of thing. There is no strategy at all. He's hoping that his love for Manchester United will kind of push them there. And, and I think one thing that this Igalo transfer might actually be good for is that it will... Ollie's always said that since Lukaku went that United are missing a target man. They're missing that guy up front mm. who's going to knock in all the chances that they're supposedly creating. Well, they were linked with Mandzukic in the summer, who yeah. I think would have been brilliant. Would have actually been really good. He went to the Middle East. He's, but, he's got one goal in the Middle East. Has he? <laughs> he's really struggled. But he's a good player. He's, 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 he's a good player. player. But, yeah. he's very competitive. I guess it's yeah. hard to <laughs> yeah. motivate yourself when you're in... But if he doesn't, if he doesn't score those goals, mm. then that just shows up that whatever style of football Ali thinks United are playing, they're not. And I think we all know they're not. Mm. But it's just about everyone else realising that. It was, a, it was all goodwill at the beginning, wasn't it? Because it was, everybody knew it was temporary. Yeah. And as soon as it became permanent and mm-hmm. became a lot more serious. I think the key thing is here with this transfer, above all else, is that Ali has said that this system, all, it, all it's missing mm. is a finisher. Yep. And a Gallo, all he is, is a finisher. So if he doesn't complete the system, mm. then it just proves that the system is a failure. And as a result, Solskjaer is a failure. So, should have United signed Glenn Murray instead? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, absolutely. Boy. It's funnier. He's, he's, <laughs> he's 36 years old and he looks like a plumber. Like, get him up front for United. And he's quality, to be and fair. He, I, in my opinion, he's a better finisher than Igalo. Igalo really? has really hot streaks, but even in his good season in 15-16, um, he went 10 hours without scoring a goal in the second half of the season. If you're a postman, you go 10 hours without delivering a letter, you get fired. <laughs> <laughs> I go 10 hours without writing, you get fired. It's not, like, it's not good. Yeah. And, and then he, he took that into, he signed a new five-year contract at Watford, then took it into next season, scored one goal in, I think it was 18, mm. and then moved to China in January. Glenn Murray, look, he's a handful. Mm. That, that he is. He is. He's just a handful. I, it, I, it'd be more entertaining for me, that's the only reason. Right, let's, let's talk about missed signings in the January transfer window. So, obviously, um, Murray's an option mm. for United, potentially. Who else could have United signed instead of Agallo? Well, they could have gone for someone like Olivier Giroud, maybe, because mm. he's not getting any games at Chelsea. Um, I think the main reason why Lampard and Chelsea didn't let him go was because they didn't get a replacement in. Um, and with Tammy's injury mm. and Batshuayi not really being as good as people want him to be, I think he was reluctant to let his third striker go. Um, but I, well, with strikers in the, in the transfer window, you kind of need one to move for them all to move. Mm. There was a couple. There was a January window a couple of years ago where Aubameyang went from Dortmund to Arsenal, Batshuayi went from Chelsea to Dortmund, and then Giroud went from Arsenal to Chelsea. So it's like a mm. merry-go-round that you need one to make all the dominoes fall. But um, Giroud would have been a great signing for at least like twelve sides in mm. in the Premier League, I think. Um, so yeah, I'm surprised he didn't he didn't really push for that. It's crazy, really, because he's like World Cup winner. You know, he's 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 a big name. It's in uh, the year of the Euros as well, so mm. he's, he has real motivation to kind of 
force well, I don't I don't know what Deschamps thinking, but mm. he was his starting striker at the World Cup they mm. won, yeah. so presumably he has a good chance of being that again, but at the moment it's not looking likely. I think his place in the squad is pretty safe, but it's yeah. in the starting eleven with yeah. Him. yeah. It is one of those things, it's a weird one with Drew because he needs he kinda of, like any player, he needs like any striker, he needs goals to guarantee guarantee his place in the squad. Even though once he's or in, his, in the first team, but once he's there, he doesn't need goals. Mm. Do you know, like in the Euros? Yeah, he scored. Did he no, score? in the World Cup. No, in the World Cup, he didn't, he, didn't score. he didn't score. But he was so important there. Yeah, he was like such a great foil, and I think that's kind of like the, the blueprint for, for what he could have done at United as well. Is like, don't get me wrong, none of the United players are Antoine Griezmann, like mm. at all. Um, but. <laughs> They're not. No, <laughs> They're right. Right. No. He plays for Barcelona. He plays yeah. for Barcelona. They're different people, um, <laughs> but. I think that you know, the United split the strikers the United have. You've got like you know Marshall, Rashford, Greenwood. These are like quick, mobile, skillful players mm. that you know are trying to are being asked to plug holes that um, that they just don't fit into. And I think that someone like him, the kind of big man, who is like he is, he's fairly close to world class in terms of knowing what his job is on the pitch. He performs his role very well. Yeah, yeah. and he's. Gorgeous as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he is, to be fair. Yeah. But like, I, I, United would have actually really benefited from him, uh, as you're saying, because watching them over the past few games, I'm trying to work out what their attacking tactic is. Because like last week we spoke about their complete lack of strategy on and off the pitch. Mm -hmm. And it seems that all they do is they build up very slowly, and then in the final third they like fizz it into somebody's feet. Mm and then try and one-two their way through like yeah. a really crowded defence and then it inevitably doesn't come off and then they try again and it's just, it's pretty pointless. But if you have Giroud in the mix who can hold off defenders and is really good at, even when it's not up to his head and his chest, really good at little flicks to on-rushing players like Griezmann mm. or like that Wilshire goal, you know, six or seven years yeah, ago, yeah. then he would have really benefited them. Um, so yeah, he's like the sort of profile of player that United should have signed. but. Um, just various factors meant they couldn't, I guess. I think the key thing with Drew, unfortunately, is that um, it seems that unless he is staying in London, he's not going to move anywhere else in the Premier League. Yeah, that's true. And he turned down Newcastle. He turned down, well, he probably would have turned down Manchester United. Um, two clubs, mm -hmm. unfortunately, on very similar levels. Yeah. Who do you think has had a good transfer window? Which team do you think has kind of done the best business? In the Premier League, yeah, it's. In, I, I'm going to do a weird thing now, and I feel uncomfortable doing it. But I'll, I'll defend United by saying that it seems it seems difficult for any club to to do anything serious in this window because Spurs were also after a striker and they mm. they, they couldn't sign anyone. Um, there's to very be fair there's to Spurs. No they they brought in Jensen Fernandez, who I like. I don't know. It almost felt like like Mourinho wanted him midfielder, but it sort of felt like he was just getting him so that I don't know to piss off Moyes or something mm. like that. Um, because I don't think that Fernandez is particularly good. He's no, he, playing he, very much for Benfica. He, he won't be there long term, will he? <laughs> no, but but I, so that maybe yeah, Spurs. I think like Stephen Bergwijn, brilliant debut. Like he was a top top player in the um, in the Dutch league. And I sound like Marson now, <laughs> never never having watched him. Uh, top top player. But uh, but like he clearly like he showed against Man City that. Um, he's got the quality mm. and he's young and he's kind of exactly what Spurs needed, like a goal scorer when Kane isn't, isn't fit. But also what Spurs have done really well this window is, well obviously they've sold Ericsson who's a brilliant mm. player, but since he's left there, was, there seems to be, I don't know whether I'm reading too much into celebrations, but there seems to be a m much stronger togetherness in mm -hmm. the team. If you saw, that, you saw that when Bergvine scored against City, the, the celebrations were really like you saw something had changed since mm. Ericsson left and Danny Rose, who um, I think Newcastle was like the perfect place for him. They play wing backs, he'll get games when Willems is injured mm. and uh, ev evidently he was very unhappy at Spurs for a long time. Mm. So to clear out those two, bring in a body in midfield, which is what they needed, like anyone. A body. Oh, it's just, mm. body. Jetson Fernandez is a body. Human torso. Wanyama, yeah, just like a Wanyama is no longer a body Organ. in midfield. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Yama's big, the biggest body. You yeah, yeah, that's it's very true. Immobile, though. But yeah, you, yeah, you can't. It's the quality I'm, of body, I'm, not the quantity <laughs> I'm still quite sad about the demise of Victor Wanyama. I don't know. He was very much. good. Yeah, me too. Good. That season, their final season at White Hart Lane, he was, he was top class. Mm. But yeah, so they've got another body midfield, they've got another goal scoring attacker, and they've cleared off two players who didn't want to be at the club. So they have 
won the transfer window. I, I do agree on the celebration thing. I think like that, that Rose going and Ericsson going has definitely helped the morale and stuff. But I do think that we can focus too much on those sort of things. Yeah. Too, like, and I think that that is like, I think Mourinho loves people focusing on that sort of thing because Jose comes into a club like he has with Tottenham mm. who have just like divorced the most wonderful man in the world in Maur- Mauricio Pochettino. Mm. He comes in and he's like, all right, life is crap. The apocalypse is coming. And we're all going to die, some of you, sooner rather than later. Sergio is um, playing right back. Sergio is playing right back. He's like so he's a sentient being. Do you know what I mean? Everything is awful and only I can make it better. So then people actually like cling on to things like celebrations being like, yeah. the, team, the team love each other again. <laughs> they love each other. We're, yeah. They're a happy bunch, you know? It detracts from the dreadful performance. I know they won 2-0, but mm. they were terrible for like yeah, 60 minutes really against City. Yeah. It changed with the red card, but... So Tottenham have done some great business in the transfer window. Mm. What about Arsenal? Do you think that they've strengthened their team at all? You could probably strengthen strengthen Arsenal's team by I don't know, like putting Ooh. a poster of Dennis Bergkamp in the dressing room, <laughs> um, yeah, or like a mannequin or something. I think <clears throat> I, it's it's really hard to talk about Arsenal in the same way as you talk about actual other fo- like other actual football teams because they don't function as one anymore. Mm. You know. Um, I don't really know what they're trying to do. I don't really know how they're going to achieve it. And I don't really think anyone there actually knows either. Mm. Um, like they brought in Pablo Mari from Flamengo, which I mean, like, I guess it seems like a decent move because he, I mean, he won a couple of Dores, he was decent. Um, and they brought in Cedric from Southampton, which is like the complete opposite of that. Like, he, this is a guy who was already pushed out of the Southampton team by Jan Valery, um, was good for a while, won the Euros with Portugal, but like Southampton thought that he was going to like a lower league, like a team in a division below. He's a really weird one, isn't he? Because he went on loan to Inter last season. Yeah. Ne- or the season before, whenever. Never played, mm. came back, got back in the starting eleven, and has mm. now been sold. It's a re- he's very strange. He's like late 20s declining. Yeah. But he'll just be back up to Bayer and money. And then Maitland Niles can then move back into midfield. I think yeah. that seems to be the plan with that. Mm. But they still have Callum Chambers, they do, don't they? No, he's had injuries. He's got a long term injury. Well, I mean, he's always injured, but he's still there. He's, he is he's still, still there. Yeah. Is what yeah. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's, still, he's, still, he's, still, he's still an Arsenal yeah. player. I mean, he'll still be there in five years injured. And, yeah, so yeah. he'll be the new. As will we'll Rob Holding. Yeah, and everyone, and then he'll come back and he'll be 33 and everyone will be like, oh, he's got a good future. But I think the key thing with Arsenal is that they're kind of similar to United, but almost sadder, mm. in a way, in that... Oh, I don't know. United, no, 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 no. Right. United are, f- are in decline massively, but they're fighting the decline mm. and, like, throwing just, like... With a, a Gala. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but Arsenal are in decline and they're just, like... So we might as well get a player on loan, <laughs> do you know? Like, yeah, Southampton's kind of, back up, right? Southampton's back up. Um, I mean, this is how bad it is. Nil nil draw at Burnley, four draws in a row. They've only won six Premier League games all season. Only the bottom two have won less. Where is the Arteta bounce? That, that is a damning stat, isn't it? Six, six wins I mean, all season. It's pretty, pretty horrendous. That really. is appalling. But <clears throat> I think you can see a change, a slight change, not in the results yet. But you can see a change in Arteta's team compared mm. to Emery's team. Mm. Um, tactically, they seem more astute. They've got Arteta's kind of go, trying to go with this like weird two-three-five in attack or like three-two-five where certain players tuck in, and that's meant to allow Özil more freedom going forward. And you know they looked good against Bournemouth in their cup replay mm. uh, when Saka scored. Like that was a nice team goal. So there are some promising signs. Mm. It's just. The results are not showing it yet. It's kind of been a write-off season for them. But it is like shambolic, you know. I think it's Arsenal fans when they look back on the towards the end of the Wenger era, they must wish that they could get that back, at least a part of it, right? Because back then, what well, what constituted a bad season was, oh, we're, we're playing this lovely football, but like we can't win games. We're mm-hmm. just trying to walk it in, you know. We got a philosophy, philosophy, but with no end goal. That doesn't exist anymore. Mm. Arsenal play some of the most boring football around. The game against Burnley and the game against Everton were two of the worst games of football I've ever watched in my entire yeah, life. I have to admit, I didn't watch the Burnley game because I knew yeah. if it was anything like the Everton game, yeah. which I completely regret. So you have watched yeah. it then because you watched the Everton game. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know what I mean? Mustafi was thing. Arsenal's best player against yeah. Burnley. Fuck Mustafi. Yeah. Mustafi. Mustafi. Like, 
Okay, Jay Rodriguez should have scored, right? Yeah. And I love him, and I won't criticise him for not scoring, but... He's like, a nice pony, so. He looks like a pirate, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, but, like, the game against Everton in particular, Arteta coming in, Ancelotti coming in, like, never would you have, like, two men in the same vicinity must never have felt so much regret at what they had done than taking over those teams. And I do think that Arteta has made an improvement, but, but things were so bad to begin with in every area of that team. Like, they've got, it's a weird thing, I don't know, it's almost like some sort of, I don't play a FIFA Ultimate Team, but I've tried it out. And you know you start off with like a really, really crap team of players who are like 60, 50, whatever, uh -huh. and you can get like some loan signings? That's what Arsenal's team is like. So it's like a load of fucking duds, mm. um, this with, like oh, so a team problem. of Poindexters, and then like, oh, this loan signing for six games here. And then we've got Ozil, we've got one of the best strikers in the Premier League in Aubameyang. And it's like the most lopsided thing in the world. And they still can't play good football. They still can't. It really shouldn't be like this. They have, they signed a 72 million pound player in the summer, yeah. and he couldn't get on against Burnley, mm. even though Ozil's had one assist all season. He can play mm. Ozil's role. Lacazette was up front. He hasn't scored away from home in a year. Yeah. And you have a 72 million pound player on the bench that isn't coming on. Just say his name. Just say his name. Nicholas Pepe. I know it hurts you to say. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't hurt me. I, I feel bad for him. I feel bad that Arsenal spent 72 million pounds mm. on a player that can't get in the team mm -hmm. or just. It, Clearly, he's like clearly he was a good player. Yeah, he was good at Lille. You see glimpses of it sometimes. Marcelo yeah. Bielsa, apparently, when he was Lille manager, like watched every single game Pepe had played and you know signed him. So clearly, there's a, there's a player there, but it's just like Arsenal's sucking the life out of him. I don't know. Nicolas Pepe wasn't even Arsenal's first choice for that position in the summer. They actually wanted Wilfred Zaha, but Palace were demanding so much money for him that they turned to Nicolas Pepe and paid 72 million pounds for a player that wasn't even top of their big money shortlist. And I think that, that says it all. They can't get the players they want. They overplay, overpay for the players that they don't necessarily want. It's just, it's just obscene. It is, it's sad. I think like, Arsenal well, kind of made, like yeah, every, every team has bad transfers. Mm. Every team buys a player that they think is going to do well and doesn't. What made Arsenal's pursuit, and maybe it could end up being good, but right now he's not really that good. What made Arsenal's pursuit of him so sad is that they were going on, like, kind of all feeling sorry for themselves during the transfer, that transfer window, being like, oh, we've only got 40 million to spend, do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, we're not going to do anything. And then it's like, a joke, we bought, we spent 72 million. Oh, on who? Like, it must be, like, an amazing player, you know? On Nicolas Pepe. Is that, is that panic buying, do you think? It's good PR, that's what it is. Yeah. Because when they make out, like, they don't have a lot of money to spend, mm. and then it's, you know, over-delivering on, like, under-promise, over-deliver, over so it's good PR. And it's a little bit of a panic buy, but they did need a winger. Mm -hmm. And But it, it, it's a case of, like, if if they f suddenly get a genius manager in, like, in a couple of years' time, or he leaves and goes somewhere else, he might just be brilliant again, because he was good at Lille. So it's like it, it's a case of, like, very similar to Manchester United, Arsenal could be making him a lot worse, like, preventing mm. him from performing to his highest level. Because he's, he's surely got talent, but he's just not performing, so... Mm. 72 million pounds for a player that isn't going to immediately deliver. It's a lot of money. It's an absolutely staggering amount of money, 72 million pounds. People were saying, give soldiers footballers wages. Mm. They're not soldiers, but you could give 3,138 nurses a starting salary for that amount of money. And Arsenal would be better off for it. That's you know, a great stat. That's some, a great stat. Some of them would probably play centre off. You wow. know, they, yeah. they could stop. Yeah, they'd have, uh, they'd have fewer injuries as well. They can put them in the stands, yeah. <laughs> during the Europa League games, <laughs> fill out the grounds. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think that'd be miles better. The nurses would beat them in a game of football. I believe the nurses would simply trample them to death, <laughs> just by there being so many of them. Sheer on the numbers. Pitch. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. Arsenal players would have. If I mean, imagine us here, right? There's how many of us? There's six of us six here of in us. this room, right? So let's say that means that there's. By, four and two, you know, yeah. when you do the ratios then, just do my maths, it's like 1,700 nurses. If they're running at great speed at us, we'll be flattened. Very congested midfield. Mm. There's, uh, no, there's no way through It's that. a bold tactic. It is a bold tactic, yeah. but I would dare say that they would all survive and we would all die. And, um, and I believe that's what will happen to Arsenal football. But then they'd... they'd can you even fit through that? They'd you, wouldn't they? they yeah, the they'd you wouldn't nurse us back to health. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, they job. There's no yeah. harm done. That's true, true. <laughs> so what do we think Arsenal's biggest problem is? You can't really define one problem mm. that they can fix and suddenly become good again because it's not like they're missing 
a commanding centre-back. I mean, they are, but it's not just that. It's not like they're missing a solid defensive midfielder. Again, they are, but it's not just that. Literally all over the pitch, bar Aubameyang, but even he's like 30 now. They're, they're just lacking quality all throughout the squad. So mm. they need to upgrade in every position, except for maybe like, yeah, Aubameyang, Bellerin. Leno. Leno. And if, if Tierney gets yeah. fit, then those four can stay. But the rest of the squad aren't good enough, that basically. So they've just let the squad get worse and worse over the last sort of five years to the point where they're just, they maybe shouldn't be considered part of the traditional big six anymore. They're in Everton. They're just Everton. They're just Everton. Yeah, and people think their problem is like Arsenal fan TV. It's not. It's not. They're, just, they're just not very good. They're a mid-table team now. Mm. That's it. So if at the start of the season, Everton and Arsenal, both looking for a manager. Do you think it would have made more sense if Arteta had gone to Everton and Ancelotti to Arsenal? It would have made a lot more sense, yeah. I mean, yeah. this is this season's just been so weird in terms of the kind of managerial roundabout that we've had. Mm. Mourinho at Spurs still doesn't feel quite right, you know. But mm. yeah, Ancelotti and Arteta are the wrong, the wrong teams. Mm. I think that's, you know, Ancelotti, the, th the thing Ancelotti, he's such a big personality and he's big, like uh, every player who's worked under him says that He's just like a proper motivator, like an arm around the shoulder kind of guy. And do you not think that's perfect for like people like David Luiz, who like yeah. just needs a hug every five minutes, otherwise, <laughs> otherwise he just loses his mind, you know? <laughs> like Arsenal have a lot of, I don't want to call them babies, but mm. they are babies in the squads. And they need, like, <laughs> they need, need, they need big cuddly Carlo to, yeah. Just, yeah. to just David kind Luiz of, doesn't have object permanence. Like yeah. if, if his manager isn't there, if he can't see his manager, he believes his manager no longer exists yeah. and he freaks out, mm. you know? Yeah. Um, when somebody walks down the stairs and the cat's yeah, yeah, yeah. he thinks crying. they've been crushed. Yeah. Um, Mesut Ozil needs constant reassurance. Yeah. Mm. He's great, uh, otherwise... Also, like, Arteta is f um, understood to be quite blunt and not mm. very warm with his mm. players. Um, so, yeah, exactly. Maybe, maybe it's completely the wrong fit. Whereas at Everton, it probably would have been slightly less pressure, mm -hmm. so a good place for him to cut his teeth as a head coach as, a, as opposed to an assistant manager where they've got a lot of talent in the squad and he could have, there'd be, there'd be a lot more leeway for like not improving the results immediately, whereas at Arsenal, we're already asking questions about him because they're not winning. Right, I think that about covers it, gents. Thank you very much to Wayne Farry, Ruben Pinder and Carl Picknell. Join us next week for more Football Trending.